Ever wish you could walk around inside of the home from the Waltons? Well, today's your lucky day because that's exactly what we're about to do. Hi, I'm Marina Coates. Welcome to Behind the Scenes, where we get up close and personal with all your favorite TV and movie homes. You know how there's places you go, places you visit, that feel almost like comfort food? They don't feel the belly, but they feel your soul. They're warm, inviting, safe, peaceful. Well, that's what the Walton's home is to me. And judging by the number of requests I've gotten for this home, I'm not alone. Somehow, even if you never actually lived in that time period or experienced a home life like that, you still want it. You want it to exist. You wish it could be like that. And there's definitely something about the home itself. It's not just a house. A home is a house with memories attached to it. And we spent a lot of time here. It has some good memories. Let's get started. As many of you know, the Walton's TV series was based on a book written by Earl Hamner Jr. about his real-life family. It was first presented as the movie Spencer's Mountain. Earl had a heavy influence on every aspect of the show and was even the narrator we hear in each episode. Today we'll get to hear from Earl's brother Paul, who actually grew up in the real-life Walton's home. We'll get to listen to his memories as we tour each of the rooms. The set went through a lot of changes over the course of the series, so I had to choose a season and then stick with it. I chose season two when John Boy still lived at home. Let's look at an overhead view to get our bearings first. Notice the living room is not square. We have an angled wall here, which is typical in TV homes as it helps with filming. I choose to keep the homes exactly as they were shown to us on TV, wonky walls and all. So as we walk through them, everything will be just as we remember it. In this corner, there was a radio with seating for the family. The piano was on this wall. The main seating area was here where many scenes took place. This door in season two led to the grandparents' bedroom. But later on in season four, it was shown as a closet. That actually happens a lot in TV homes. On this wall, they had a photo of FDR, who was the president at the time. I asked Paul Hamner if they actually had one on their wall in his home growing up, and he said, yes, they did. And on this wall was the fireplace and secretary desk, where we would often see John sitting as he worked on the bills. One of my favorite features of this home is the fireplace with its unique shape and a short set of steps bordering two sides of it that then meet at a landing before heading up the full staircase. So unique, so well done. Having different levels in a home is an element frequently used in set design. It's often for staging purposes such as entrances, but it would add drama and character to any home. Big shout out to the set designers of this home. Thank you for giving us this warm, memorable home we all love. You'll notice as we tour the home that I've left the rattan shades on the windows as they had them on the show, but I did away with some of the curtains so that we can see outside. That way it feels less like a set and more like a real home. As we take the tour now, Paul Hamner will be reminiscing about life in the real Walton's home. We got along as a family. We could discuss things. We had talks. Um, even if it's just about the neighbor down the road or world events, we were we enjoyed each other's company, my brothers and sisters. Before bedtime every evening, we would gather as a family in the living room. And of course, the smaller children would like to get closest to the radio. I remember we could not wait for the show to come on, Amos and Andy. And this happened almost every night. But on the flip side was Edward R. Morrow newscast, 
we had a brother in, stationed in Paris during the war, and sometimes the news was not so good, and we were very concerned. So, but anyway, it was an event for the family. And now on to the kitchen. Let's start with an overhead view of the room. On this end, we have the stove and a hot water heater. A mystery door is here that we never get to see the inside of. Perhaps it was a pantry. There was a movable kitchen island here. It showed up in various spots on different episodes. The main cabinet tree was along these walls. An ice box here. An ironing board took up this space by the bay window. And of course, the large kitchen table where many scenes took place was here. Also on this end was the screened-in porch. Notice the odd shape due to the living room wall being at an angle. Later, I'll take us on a walk through this side porch so we can finally see the inside of it. Some features to take note of before we tour the kitchen. Notice the type of light switches they had on their walls. Also, there was a single light bulb that hung over the ironing board. And rather than a third window in the bay area, there was a built-in cabinet. There was a Tiffany-style lamp over the dining room table that was sometimes there and sometimes not. We see built-in cabinet tree here and benches on either side of the table instead of chairs. I asked Paul if that was the arrangement around their kitchen table growing up, and he said it was. And now we'll take the kitchen tour as we listen to Paul Hamner remembering life inside of the real Walton's home. We enjoyed very much sitting around that table. I thought it was a large table at the time, but as I look back, it was small, but we all fit and the meals were terrific. The kitchen table was the hub for the family and the whole house because Even when there was not mealtime, we would gather there. We would talk about events and stuff there. And um, the, the kitchen was always a popular place to hang out. Every square inch of the Walton's home served a purpose. On the stair landing, there's a sewing area where Olivia did her sewing, and another entrance into the grandparents' bedroom, also a mannequin dress form, and some built-in cupboards. In the grandparents' room, we see another bay window, a dresser, and a wash basin. We never got to see the fourth wall, but you will today. and now we'll tour the entire main floor. I'll take us in through the side porch so we get to see views not shown to us on TV. Why do we love these TV homes so much? Why do they have more meaning to us than just four walls, especially since we never lived there? 
I believe a clue to the answer lies in a speech given in the movie Field of Dreams. It was spoken by the character Terence Mann, played by James Earl Jones. He explains why people are drawn to a ball field out in the middle of Iowa. But after having read your comments on my other tours, I believe it applies to these homes as well. People will come, Ray. They'll come to Iowa for reasons they can't even fathom. They'll turn up your driveway, not even sure why they're doing it. They'll arrive at your door as innocent as children longing for the past. Of course, we won't mind if you look around, you'll say. It's only $20 per person. They'll pass over the money without even thinking about it. It's money they have. It's peace they lack. They'll walk up to the bleachers and sit in the shirt sleeves on a perfect afternoon. They'll find they have reserved seats somewhere along the baselines where they sat when they were children and cheered their heroes. And they'll watch the game. And it will be as if they dip themselves in magic waters. The memories will be so thick they'll have to brush them away from their faces. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. Memories are strong things. They're what makes a house a home. When a home taps into special feelings, comfort food moments from our youth, when we felt warm and safe and at peace, then something magical happens, something that transcends architecture, that goes beyond lumber, brick, and mortar, and definitely beyond design trends. The home becomes part of us because it tells our story. And speaking of memories, coming up at the very end of this episode, I'll do a tour of the main floor, all done up for the holidays. Just as in the real-life home, the front porch was a place where the family gathered often. Paul Hamner shares some of his favorite memories there. The swing was a big attraction. It only held two people at a time. But we even entertained their friends on the front porch. We talked, we played games in the evening after dinner, before bed. When it's summer, we would all go out, sit on the porch and listen for the night sounds. And it was wonderful. It was so, so nice. My mother and father were relaxed. You could hear whippoorwills. You could hear insects. You could hear the train crossing the trestle in rockfish. Best time of my life, really. Now let's move upstairs. We'll start with an overhead view. At the top of the stairs, when you turn to your right, we see steps leading up to the attic. After that is John Boy's room. Next to that is a room used as the girls' room and at other times as the parents' room. Here we have the bathroom, and after that, the boys' room. Of course, what we likely remember most about this room is John Boy's writing desk placed right in front of the window overlooking the front yard. There was also a closet here, and oddly, there's a door in the hallway that would have opened up into that same closet. He has a wash basin here and a high boy chest over on this wall. His bed sits here. Let's tour John Boy's room now. The girls' room is fairly large, with three iron beds, a dresser, a wash basin, and a closet. I always loved the scenes here when Olivia Walton, played by Michael Learned, would come into the room to tuck the girls in at night. Let's tour the girls' room now. You'll notice the similarities later between this room and the parents' room coming up, since they use the same set, just with different furnishings.
We got to see quite a few scenes in here later on in the series. Notice the old-fashioned type of toilet with a chain. Paul Hamner explains how they managed with eight children and only one bathroom. I give my mother credit for having things under control. Of course, there was not enough hot water even for everybody to take a bath. So she would space it out. You're, you're at two o'clock or you're at four o'clock. But meanwhile, she was boiling water on the back of the wood stove to put in the bathtub. I, I never remember it being a problem. And, and only my mother could do it. We were shown three beds and three boys in this room on the show, with a separate room for John Boy. But in real life, Paul said his family had all of the boys in one room. There was no separate room for Earl, or John Boy, as he was known on the show. We didn't get to see the parents' room very often, but we do know what was on all but the fourth wall. Of course, today, you'll get to see it with all four walls. Do you see the similarities between the parents' room and the girls' room? Can you tell they use the same set, just with different furnishings? Coming up next, we'll walk the upstairs with all of the doors open to give you a sense of the layout up here. Then hang around to the very end of this episode, and you'll see the Waltons' home at Christmas time, with Paul telling us what Christmases were like in the real Walton home. If you want to create a home that is timeless, that creates a mood and tells the story of your family, then catch my other show on this channel called Cinematically Inspired Design, where we learn how to do just that. But as for today, that's a wrap. See you next time on Behind the Scenes. Describe a typical Christmas when you were growing up. Marina, they were sensational. Uh, we can't, I can't believe today how poor my parents were, but somehow they pulled this Christmas off every year when I was little. We'd go out in the mountains and come home with our own Christmas tree, and we used the same lights and, and decorations year after year after year. I get emotional thinking about that Christmas morning and those sweet voices of the, my, my family gathering around you know and everything was plentiful we had food and during the day uh, friends and family would show up to celebrate with us and uh, it was a marvelous really a wonderful day and it couldn't have been more joyous it was a magical day for those of you who would like to hear more of paul's memories of life in the hamner home i have a link below to the full interview you'll even get to see paul Good night, John Boy. Good night, Earl. Good night, Paul. Thanks for sharing your memories and your childhood with us.